I have prayed for so long that my people would go to Kansas and that God would make straight the way before them. I believe as much in that move as I do in the moving of the children of Egypt going out to Canaan. Sojourner Truth The Kansas Prairie Ancestral Lands of Akamza Arapaho Pawnee and Cheyenne Home of the Buffalo Soldiers The Great Cattle Drives The Homesteaders and the most iconic black frontier town in America, Nicodemus, Kansas. The Nicodemus story is inspiring because we are a living legacy. We're still here. We're descendants of those folks that um, had tenacity, had vision, had faith in God. But these are hollowed grounds. The ancestors left something here, and that you need to pick up, and you can't do that by zooming in. You just can't. In August 1867, a surveying party for the Kansas Pacific Railroad ventured into the tribal lands of the Cheyenne Nation in the Saline River Valley near Fort Hayes, Kansas. The Cheyenne warriors, learning of the incursion, rode out, tracked the surveyors, and killed them. A few days later, the Cheyenne engaged with the United States Cavalry Unit that had been sent in pursuit of them. When the warriors neared the Americans, they were surprised. These were not the white-faced soldiers they had fought before. Their skin was black. Their fighting, ferocious. This was the 10th Cavalry, a regiment of African-American Civil War veterans redeployed to the Great Plains. After an indecisive six-hour battle, the Cheyenne disengaged and rode off across the prairie. They had seen a new foe, and according to tradition, would give them a new name. Buffalo Soldiers The Battle of the Saline River was the first ever battle of the Buffalo Soldiers. It was also one of the last battles between the U.S. Army and Native Americans in north-central Kansas. The Kansas Pacific would soon be completed, and a few years later, it would bring another party of African Americans to the Kansas High Plains. In September 1877, the Kansas Pacific Railroad pulled into Ellis Station, Ellis County. 350 travelers disembarked, formerly enslaved African Americans from Kentucky, seeking free land and a new life on the Kansas prairie. They had already come nearly 1,000 miles, but their journey wasn't over. Before them lay the Kansas prairie as far as the eye could see, all the way to the horizon. The settlers placed their belongings on wagons, slung burlap sacks over the shoulders, and headed north. On the first day, they forded the Saline River, just upstream from the site of the Buffalo Soldiers' battle with the Cheyenne ten years before. On the second day, after an exhausting 35-mile journey, their destination was in sight. Walena Hickman, one of the later pioneers, recalled the moment her husband Daniel spotted their new home. When we got in sight of Nicodemus, the men shouted, There is Nicodemus! I looked with all the eyes I had. I said, Where is Nicodemus? I don't see it. My husband pointed out various smokes coming out of the ground and said, that is Nicodemus. The families lived in dugouts. 
the scenery was not at all inviting. And I began to cry. In May 1862, four months before the Emancipation Proclamation and three years before the 13th Amendment, Abraham Lincoln signed another act into law, the Homestead Act. Nicodemus's Daniel Hickman had been made free by the 13th Amendment. Now the Homestead Act, he hoped, would make him and his family economically independent. After their arrival in Graham County, Reverend Hickman and his family made a dugout, where he also held the town's Baptist church services. Later, they built a sod house, plowed the rugged Kansas prairie, and planted crops. Five years later, Hickman filed his homestead claim. Two weeks after filing, his claim was official. June 14, 1887 Homestead Certificate Number 8816 Pursuant to the Act of Congress to secure homesteads of actual settlers on the public domain, the claim of Daniel Hickman has been established and duly consummated in conformity to law. There is therefore granted by the United States unto David Hickman the tract of land to have and to hold, and to his heirs and assigns forever. Signed, Grover Cleveland, President of the United States. Daniel Hickman, an African-American once owned a slave property by a white man and forced to labor to enrich his enslaver on a Kentucky farm he himself could never dream of owning. Now, he, Daniel Hickman, thanks to the Homestead Act and his own sweat and toil, owned his own 160-acre farm, all the crops he cultivated, and all the profits of his labor. In the 1880s and 90s, dozens more settlers homesteaded land, winning ownership of their own farms. Perry Bates, a veteran of the 116th United States Colored Infantry in the Civil War, and his wife, America. Andrew Alexander and his sons, Alonzo and Andrew. Charles and Emma Williams, whose son, Henry, was the first baby born in Nicodemus. John and Leanna Samuels, leader of the third group of settlers. By 1899, just 22 years after Nicodemus's founding and 35 years after the end of the Civil War, Nicodemus's African-American homesteaders had received title to 114 farms and owned 18,000 acres of Kansas Prairie. As the homesteaders thrived, so did the town. Soon, Nicodemus had a post office, a hotel, a baseball team, a public school, a doctor, a bank, a livery, three newspapers, and three churches, including William's General Store, selling provisions, farm implements, tools, even cigars and cider. Back in the South, with the end of Reconstruction and withdrawal of federal troops, life had become a nightmare. The newly freed African Americans saw their political and civil rights taken away, their economic independence stolen by former enslavers turned landlords, and the security and safety of their families destroyed by the racial terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan. Hearing of the success of Nicodemus and other homesteading settlements, thousands of formerly enslaved African Americans packed up their belongings and headed up the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, bound for Kansas. This mass migration was dubbed the Exodus. The would-be homesteaders, Exodusters. The vast majority of Exodusters made it no further than Topeka or Kansas City and were never able to stake a claim to a homestead. But some did. In the decades following Nicodemus' founding, other black homesteading communities were founded across the Great Plains, 
including in Dunlap, Kansas, DeWitty, Nebraska, Sully, South Dakota, Deerfield, Colorado, and Empire, Wyoming. All told, under the Homestead Act, African-American homesteaders would become the owners of 150,000 acres of farmland across America. On April 14, 1935, Nicodemus was enveloped by a dust storm so fierce it became known as Black Sunday. The dust reached three miles into the sky, blotted out the sun, stung the faces of the townspeople, and ruined crops. Nicodemus had been losing population since the late 1880s when the railroads bypassed the town. Still, the town had held on through drought and locust infestations. The 1920s farm depression, outmigration to cities for factory jobs. But for many who had held on, the triple blow of the Dust Bowl, Great Depression, and Second World War proved too much. In the succeeding decades, the population of Nicodemus fell to less than 100. Reverend Hickman's Mount Olivet Baptist Church stopped holding services. Nicodemus Public School No. 1, the pride of the town, closed. Farmer Bernard Bates, descended of Pioneer Perry and America Bates, after putting up a spirited fight, lost the family homestead to a bank foreclosure. In the 2000s, the town site population fell to 12. Still one Nicodemus descendant, Gil Alexander, continued farming the homestead that had been in his family since the 1880s. Then, in 2017, Alexander, Nicodemus's last black farmer, died. And homecoming is a time for families to reconnect, no matter where they live in the United States. We come home. Um, this is home for us that are descendants. It's an opportunity for us to reconnect with the family, reconnect with the town. I knew I was coming home. We don't call it coming back to Nicodemus. We call it coming back home. I am hoping that the next generation of children that are descendants have a connection to this place that will create in them a desire to come back and continue to sustain this place for generations to come. Nicodemus means everything to me because, to put it simply, it's my identity. It's my passion. Um, it's what I want to work on. It's what I want to work for. It's what I, I live for. The ultimate dream for me is that Nicodemus grows into a place where African Americans will see this as a place that they can come to and reconnect with their roots as African Americans here in this United States.